The kingdom of God is going to fill up the whole earth. But it doesn't look like that right now. But it is happening. And that's one of the main obstacles that Jesus had when he dealt with on teaching people to size up the kingdom. Because you and I live just as Jesus' hearers did in a culture that tends to dismiss things that are small. Maybe you heard the story of the couple whose home was broken into a few times. They decided they needed to get a big, vicious guard dog to protect their home. So he went to a place where they sold such animals and the man there said, well, I know exactly what you need. And he brings out this little miniature poodle. And the man said, no, no, we, we need like a, a vicious guard dog, like a, like a Rottweiler, something like that. And the guy said, well, you, you don't understand. This poodle knows karate. <laughs> well, you could tell the guy looked pretty skeptical. So the man put the poodle down and he pulls out a wooden chair and he tells the dog, Karate my chair. Well, that dog pounced and it bit and it jumped and it attacked and it was rolling. And pretty soon that chair was just a pile of wood pieces. Well, he brought out a big cinder block and he set it down on the ground. And he looked at the dog and said, Karate my cinder block. Well, the poodle pounced and attacked and it bit. And before you know it, the cinder block is just a pile of rock pieces and dust. The guy was impressed. I'll take him. So he goes home with that dog and he walks into the house carrying this little miniature poodle. And his wife looked at him and said, what is that? And he puts the dog on the ground and he says, this is our new guard dog. She said, that's not a guard dog. That's just a poodle. We, we need a giant dog to protect our house. He said, honey, you don't understand. This dog knows karate. She said, Karate my foot. <laughs> you see, the tendency in our culture is to only be impressed with size and noise. But Jesus calls us to reject such criteria when it comes to evaluating the significance of of the kingdom of God. Sizing up the kingdom requires a, a different perspective. And so in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells two very short parables to illustrate and help people rethink how the kingdom of God looks in this world. Read with me in Matthew 13, beginning in the 31st verse. It says this. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all your seeds. Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowds in parables. He did not say anything to them without using parables. And so was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now notice that Jesus is teaching insight on the kingdom that has always been true, but was not revealed to men until he appeared. And so, he did something he's done before. He, he takes the same thought and he tells two different stories to illustrate the same thought. And he does this because he's wanting to make these stories gender specific. And notice he tells two because... As a side note, there are only two genders. He did this, for example, in Luke chapter 15. He tells a story of a man who lost his sheep and he went out and he found it. And he brings it back and he throws this big party. And all the men were listening and they nodded. You know, I've, I've been to a couple parties like that. 
And he tells the story of a woman that loses a coin that was part of her dowry. And, and she turned her house completely upside down to find that coin. And when she found it, she threw a party and all the women were nodding. You know, I've been to a party just like that. He's doing the same thing in these two parables because he's trying to teach a point that is so important. He doesn't want anybody to miss this. So he tells a story about planting a seed so that all of the men who are listening could get it. And he tells a story about putting some leaven into a loaf so that all the women could get it because he wants all the people that are listening to get this story. He wants everybody to, to rethink and reevaluate the reign of God and how it will conquer the world. Look again at verses 34 and 35 from the New Living Translation in our text. It says this, Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. This fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet. I will speak to you in parables. I will explain things hidden since the creation of the world. In other words, before you can grasp the mystery of the kingdom of God, you need to grasp the mystery of it. And the mystery that Jesus is dealing with when he compares the kingdom to a mustard seed or to leaven is simple. It's this. In what ways is the reign of God ever small? If God has always been king over the entire world, then how can his kingdom be small? You have to remember that Jesus is speaking to a people that know the Old Testament prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And they interpreted these prophecies to mean that when the Messiah came, he's going to shake up this whole world. There's going to be a, this dramatic and catastrophic change to everything and everybody's going to know about it. The son of David is going to sit again on the throne in Jerusalem and the world is going to be conquered by him. The lion's going to lay down with the lamb, the plowshare or the swords are going to be beaten into plowshares. That's what they were expecting when the Messiah comes. John, who had a very impressive ministry in the desert, even said, after me is coming someone who will make me look like a nobody. I'm not even worthy to touch his sandals. If you think I'm impressive, just wait till he comes. So everybody's tense. Everybody's anticipating and Jesus shows up and he starts calling himself the Messiah, making these very high claims and modeling such low ways. How could the humble ministry of this Galilean be the dawning of a new age? They're wondering. Even John gets confused. In fact, John is kind of disappointed because Herod puts John the Baptist in prison, and that's exactly the kind of king they thought the Messiah was going to dethrone when he came. So even John sends messengers to ask Jesus the question, are you sure you're the one? I mean, I thought you were the one, but now I'm in prison, and I don't know anymore. Am I supposed to be looking for somebody else? You see, instead of showing up and shaking the earth like they thought he was going to do, Jesus shows up and preaches service instead of power. He preaches, love your enemies instead of destroying them. He admits that he's meek and lowly. People wanted size. They wanted noise. And they got a mustard seed. You see, the mystery of the kingdom is that through the person of Jesus, the kingdom of God has come, but it has not yet overthrown all evil and all of the other kingdoms in this world. It's come in their midst. It is existing among them. And it is influencing this age in invisible, almost imperceptible ways. By reigning in the hearts of people who have embraced the way of Jesus. And so Jesus said one time to the Pharisees in Luke chapter 17, after he was asked when the kingdom of God would come, 
And he said, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. He came to plant the kingdom, not in seats of power, but in the hearts of lowly people. Well, that's not very impressive. Jesus would say, don't be so quick to underestimate the kingdom. Just like a mustard seed, just like leaven in dough. Wait until the whole process is complete before you render your judgment. Did any seed ever seem smaller than the arrival of Jesus? No headlines, no writing in the sky. Some teenage, dirt, poor Jewish couple put a baby in a manger. That's how you're going to change the world. But when Jesus comes again, what began as this small seed will embrace the entirety of the world. So the question that these stories are asking is this, will you embrace the reign of God now? Or will you be one of those people that continues to be impressed by size and noise from all the other kingdoms out there and continue to give your primary allegiance to them instead of to the mustard seed? You see, when it comes to the kingdom of God, most people just don't get it because they don't see it. The only way to understand the kingdom is to embrace the way of Christ. The mustard seed and the leaven are a call to imitate the way that Jesus does things. You see, Jesus believed that that service and Love and forgiveness and humility and submission were the most powerful ways to change the world. So he wasn't looking for size or noise, but for sacrifice. He did not come the way people thought he would come. Philippians chapter 2, Natalie read this at the beginning of our service. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now think about it. If his birth wasn't impressive, his death was even worse. He's supposed to bring the kingdom of God and he dies on a Roman cross with just one man and a bunch of women crying around him. And that's supposed to change this world. He deliberately chose self-denial when he had chances to promote himself and take thrones or crowns. And consequently, it didn't look like his kingdom had made a dent much less a difference in the kingdoms in this world. But the seed grew, and the leaven spread. And you know the rest of the story. Joseph Goebbels, the well-known Nazi propagandist in Hitler's war machine, they have his diary. And in his diary, several times he refers to Mahatma Gandhi, who was trying to, at the time, liberate India. And several times, Goebbels called Gandhi, in his diaries, a fool. Because Gandhi chose the path of nonviolence, of a passive resistance. Goebbels wrote this, if he would organize a military... If he would get the people behind him to take up arms, he could easily liberate India. He's a fool. 78 years later, Goebbels is dead. The Nazi war machine is crushed. India is liberated. Who's the fool? Jesus could have chose raw power, folks. 
But he knew the inability of raw power to change anybody's heart. But the problem is, down through the ages, we haven't listened to these two stories Jesus has told. We still want power. We want to change the world from the top down, making laws instead of from the bottom up, washing feet. We want to be high and mighty, not meek and lowly. And so these parables of the mustard seed and the leaven are calling all of us to re think the kingdom of God. How does it come? How does it grow? How does it advance? How is it to be modeled? The kingdom of God is rarely found among the rich and powerful. It is found among the poor in spirit, among the meek, among the people persecuted for righteousness sake. And it still appears small to many, but that's because they don't have ears to hear what Jesus was saying, and they don't have eyes to see what God is doing. And the question this morning is, what about you? Are you listening to what Jesus is teaching this morning? Are you seeing what God is doing in the world that most people can't see? Can you see the majesty all around us when most people only see mystery? Let me tell you how you will live if you do see the kingdom. You will appreciate the way God can reign through the small. Remember, history's greatest movement had its beginnings in a manger. And the kingdom of God places great emphasis on small acts. Do you know how the kingdom of God advances? By giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. By washing a pair of dirty feet. By putting two little pennies in the treasury of God when that's the last two pennies you have. By going out and looking for just one sheep when you've got a whole flock of sheep back in your pen. Jesus said is when you feed hungry people, when you go see sick people, when you put clothes on the backs of naked people, and when you do it for the least of these, the people that can never put you on TV, the people that will never get you on a magazine cover, then you are beginning to understand the kingdom of God. That nothing is small if God is in it. During World War II, there was a little boy, a little kid. He was an American. His daddy was in the army. His name was Bobby Hill. And he lived in Italy where his father was a sergeant with the Allied forces. And as a boy, as a 10-year-old child, he read about Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who was a medical missionary down in Africa. And he was moved by what he read in an article about this man. So this child, 10-year-old boy, went down to the PX on the base, and he bought a bottle of aspirin, and he mailed it. He sent it to General, Lieutenant General Richard Lindsay, who was the commander of the Allied Air Forces of Southern Europe. And he put a note. The note said, the next time one of your planes is flying over Africa, would you drop this bottle of aspirin down because Dr. Schweitzer could really use it? The general was amused. He made a comment to somebody about it, and somehow or another, this story ends up on the radio. And the next thing you know, people from all over the world started calling and donating. And they had to send a book. Bring what you have. It is dedicated to the kingdom of God. Just bring it and let God do his thing. God can reign through small things. And that also means you will appreciate the little gospel. We're always tempted to want to promote everything but Jesus at church to draw a crowd. Friend, you don't need fog machines or stage lights. You don't need a Grammy award winning praise band. You don't need a preacher that looks like he stepped off the cover of GQ magazine. Just lift up Jesus and see what happens.
Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come preaching God's secret with fancy words or a show of human wisdom. I decided that while I was with you, I would forget about everything except Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. We do not need to be victimized by bigness or loudness. The kingdom of God may not make the headlines, but it will have the last word. And that leads to the second truth. To live out the kingdom of God means that you will anticipate the day God will reign over all. The mustard seed will become a huge plant. The leaven will permeate the entire loaf. And the kingdom of God inaugurated by Jesus will one day fill this entire earth. And that's what we believe, even when we cannot see it. God's purposes will not be frustrated. The little ministry of Jesus will be vindicated. And what started minutely will end majestically massive. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23, Paul says, But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And that, after that, the end will come when he will, re, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death for the scriptures say god has put all things under his authority of course when it says all things under his authority that does not include god himself who gave christ his authority then when all things are under his authority the son will put himself under god's authority so that god who gave his son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything everywhere now, the challenge is to believe that, even when you cannot see it. Because the mustard seed is such a little seed. And the leaven is inside the loaf. And God's doing something, but you cannot always see it. But if what Paul said is true, if Jesus has started in motion a process that is going to result in God reigning supreme over everything, everywhere, then some of us had better start prioritizing our own agendas because we have been putting our money on the wrong horse. We are spending too much time and giving too much allegiance to the kingdoms of this world that are not going to make it and we're not giving enough allegiance to the only kingdom that lasts. And the idea is not that this world is going to get progressively better and better and people are going to get nicer and nicer until one day the whole world goes to church. That's, that's not it. The idea is that the kingdom of God already here, though very hard to see, is going to one day subdue the entire earth and the whole earth is going to acknowledge it even if it's too late to enter it. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was a powerful world leader. He had a dream one night. He calls in all of his astrologers and seers. I want you to interpret the dream I had. They said, okay, well, tell us the dream. He said, well, you are seers. You tell me what it was and then interpret it for me. And they said, we can't do that. Nobody can do that unless we hear the dream first. He said, if you don't, I'll cut you up into pieces. One of them said, well, I, I know a Jew. I think maybe he could do it. So they called in Daniel. And the king said, can you tell me what my dream is before I tell it to you? Daniel said, I cannot, but God can. Here's what you dreamed. You dreamed there was a big statue whose head was gold and his chest was silver and his legs were iron and his feet were iron and clay. 
And this little rock came up to the statue and started beating the feet. And the entire statue was destroyed. And that little rock grew up to a big mountain that filled the entire earth. Isn't that what you dreamed? Yeah. What does it mean? What it means is you are a kingdom now. You are that head of gold. And after you is going to come another, and after that is going to come another, and there will come another after that. But in the days of that fourth kingdom, God is going to plant a kingdom that is going to crush all the other kingdoms of the earth, and the kingdom of God is going to fill up this whole earth. So look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. In the time of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Does this mean that the entire world one day is going to be converted to Jesus? No. It does mean the whole world is going to one day be subjected And so don't be discouraged by the apparent insignificance of God. Though tiny like a seed, it's alive like a seed. God will have his harvest. Almost 1,000 years ago, there was a Danish king that ruled Britain named Canute. And he got tired of everybody telling him how great and powerful he was. So he had it ordered by his men to take his throne down to the beach and set it up right on the edge of the water. And he sat in his chair and he commanded the tide not to come in. He ordered the tide to be still and acknowledge his kingship. A couple hours later, his throne was totally wet. And historians say Canute removed his crown and placed it on a statue of the crucified Christ and he never wore it again during his reign. Wise is the man or woman who can size up the kingdom of God for what it is now and submit to Jesus' reign while submission is still a choice. One more thing. If you grasp the kingdom, you will appropriate the reign of God by surrendering every part of your heart. It boggles my mind why people wait for the rule of God over everything to experience it. Why wait? Seriously. One day God's going to rule over everything and it's going to be clear to every person. But why wait? It's not yet true in the whole world, but it could be true of you right now. So here's what you have to do. You you have to let the leaven of the kingdom of God that will eventually saturate this entire earth, you, you need to let that saturate your heart right now. You see, leaven is aggressive. It wants to permeate everything. In the same way, God is not going to settle for unruled parts of your heart. And one more thing you need to understand about the dough, it cannot change itself. Something from the outside of that dough has to be put inside of that dough. And that's what makes the change. Lean in for just a couple minutes with me. This picture. This is an unbloomed, unblossomed rose. So if I took a, 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 a bloom like this, an unblossomed rose, and I tried to, to make it look like a blossomed rose with my own hands, I would peel it open, but the petals would eventually, they'd be falling out and it would get crumpled. And by the end of it, it would look like this massive mess that I just destroyed in the end. But when God does it, it's beautiful. Because God does it not from the outside, trying to pull it open. He does it from the inside, opening this thing. What God does to change a life is He puts the leaven of the Holy Spirit inside of your heart. Because you cannot, with outward conformity, 
to rules and traditions change a heart. You have to get to a point where you let the Holy Spirit inside. And when the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, just like leaven, it's going to try to permeate every single part of that heart of yours. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not so much what you get put into. Hear this. It is what God puts into you. That's a mystery. A little four-year-old girl went to the pediatrician for a checkup, and Dr looks into her ears with an autoscope and he says, do you, th- do you think I'll find Big Bird in there? She didn't say anything. And he gets a tongue depressor and he looks down her throat. Do you think I'll find Cookie Monster in there? She didn't say anything. And he puts a steth- stethoscope to her chest and he, he listens to her heartbeat. He says, do you think I'm going to hear Barney in there? Oh no, she said. Jesus is in my heart. Barney is on my underpants. Does Jesus rule your heart? The reason some of you don't get it is because you think Jesus died so that you would be nice and come to church one hour a week. He died so that the kingdom of God would be inside of you for 24 hours a day. The famous sculptor Albert Thornson, when he made this, his famous statue of Christ with his arms out and his head bowed, he, before it was put on display, he, he first showed it to a very close friend of his who he trusted. And his friend said, you know, honestly, Albert, I don't get it. You can't see the face of Jesus. And Thornson said, if you want to see the face of Jesus, you have to get it on your knees. And you will never get the kingdom as long as there is a part of your heart you will not let the Holy Spirit have. What God is going to do in the whole world, He wants to do right in your life right now. You will never size up the kingdom until you are the right size. And you will never be the right size until every part of your heart has kneeled. I want you to stand up. I want to pray over you this morning. Father, it is not hard to understand going to church. But it is hard to understand seek the kingdom first. And we confess to you that we have learned to be very good at learning how to be nice, decent, unfruitful Christians. But we want more than that. We want what Jesus wanted for us. So Lord, if there is something in our life Today, if there is something the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us today, I pray that the Spirit will speak with such clarity that we will know exactly what it is that we must do to be completely surrendered to your reign. We pray all this in Jesus' name.